Hi. It's really good to be home tonight. It's like I grew up in Sunnyvale, you know, part of Silicon Valley, and I, I went to school here in Berkeley for one of my college years, and ever since then, any time I drive into Berkeley, it feels like you're home. If I'm in one of those two places, I feel like I'm in the home where I grew up. And what a great time. I lived in Norton Hall and walked down to Top Dog to have this event catered by Top Dog. I mean... <laughs> You couldn't do better. You know, and I, I, like to, I always like to pull pranks. I'm doing them all the time. I've done a few here at Berkeley already today. But I had this idea once for the Stanford Chancellor. And the whole idea was to somehow kidnap him or trick him into a meeting with a dentist that was going to clean his teeth. But the dentist would then emblazon go bears on his teeth <laughs> in blue and gold. And a little, a little nitrous oxide so we could, you know, tattoo his rump and put it on the internet. And then hypnotize him so that any time he heard the phrase um, terrorist, he'd say, go bears. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> um, I've never been a professor. It's interesting. You look up. Now I know what it's like. Um, I, I, I had the life of an electronics kid, and that was where you build stuff all the time. You open up magazines, you get little inexpensive parts, you hook them together with glue called solder, and you make your own little stuff. And there were a bunch of kids in my neighborhood that did this sort of stuff, so we hung around together, and we were all electronic kids, you know, building devices and getting walkie-talkies and things. And back in those days, there were companies that sold surplus parts. Any big manufacturer buys a lot of parts, and they always have extras left over, bins and bins. When I was in school, they'd take us down to Hewlett Packard and show us rooms full of junk that looked, was good stuff that they were just going to give away to employees or to schools or to somebody. They never quite knew where, and they often wound up in these stores called surplus stores. And surplus stores would sell tons of electronics parts. And there was a guy on our block that had worked in a surplus store, had run one. And he, and he had all this stuff in his garage. So when we did the gardening, we were young kids doing the gardening in his lawn. Instead of being paid in cash, we'd say, open up your garage door. We'd look at all his mayonnaise jars full of parts of resistors and capacitors and batteries and things. Oh, that looks cool. Give us those. So we would get paid in parts. It was just more important to us than money living this little electronic life. One time we built a house-to-house -house intercom and we laid the wire down the fence and across the, the, the yard and we went down to Sunnyvale Electronics on our bike and bought microphones and speakers and buzzers and we could buzz each other in the middle of the night to open up our windows and sneak out and go toilet paper houses and things like that. House-to-house -house intercom on our own. And it was so neat. We did it all with no parental suggestion, no parental know-how. Matter of fact, one of the people on the, the fence cut our wire into about 50 places. So what we did was we ran the wire on the other side of the fence of his house. And, you know, just kids thinking, you do what's interesting, you know? You don't know about laws and property rights and those sort of things. And it was so neat that we could press a button and it'll buzz Bill down in his house. And that was like reaching further out. It's like remote control. We were in charge of the world and all the kids in school that didn't know electronics didn't get to share this magical dream and this big upcoming existence, you know? Um, and we'd buy lots of electronic kits, and you'd, generally you'd put the parts together yourself, solder them all together, and build things in those days. The hi-fi in our home. My father had bought a hi-fi from a company called Heath Kit, and it came as kits, bags of parts that you put together and make your own working hi-fi. And hi-fi in those days was moving from monaural to stereo and getting better and better quality and fidelity and more low frequencies and more high frequencies. Quality was the big thing until MP3s came along. And then we'd rather have the convenience. Well, when I was in about sixth grade, I read a book by accident, nobody gave it to me, um, called SOS at Midnight, and the heroes were ham radio operators. Ham radios were no operators were noted for knowing how radio electronics worked and setting up their own devices with Morse code and with voice, and they would always jump in when there was an emergency in the world, a hurricane on some tropical island. They would start dishing out messages to get communication with people, and we were the do-gooders. We were protecting the airwaves from bad, spurious signals. And I read this book, and at the end of it, it said, you can get a ham radio license, so here's how you do it. And I said, oh my God, you don't have to be 16 years old like a driver's license. Anybody can do it. So I went and I got a ham radio license by studying. Nobody else in my school around me did it. My parents didn't do it. All on my own, I decided to do this. 
And I got a kit for Christmas, a transmitter kit and a receiver kit, hundreds of parts that you solder together and bolt things into place and run little cords for dials. And it was like such a neat discovery. And with ham radio, you could make contact with other cities, with other states, with other countries. It's like that reaching out, and it makes you feel like you're a superman. And nobody else in the school did this, so I was all alone. And I felt it was my little specialness. I went to um, a thing my mom dragged me to once, and Richard Nixon was running for governor of California. And I decided to, I was a little joker even then. And I took a sign and it said, ham radio operators of Sarah's school, it's an elementary school, unanimously support Richard Nixon for governor. <laughs> the unanimously being the joke. All of a sudden, 20 flashbulbs went off and I was on the front page of the San Jose Mercury representing a school group that they didn't get it was a joke. So the, <laughs> And the best kind of jokes are when they don't know it's a joke. When you tell a joke and they think it's somehow real. Um, you know, it's like I was just at a meeting with a bunch of engineering professors and my assistant had an appendectomy last week. And I said, oh yeah, she just had an appendectomy today and she walked out and here she is. And they said, whoa, that's macho. <laughs> well, that's, that's a technique. Lockheed and NASA grew up in Silicon Valley and they were so important to the development of the transistor industry, the early transistor companies, and the move towards chips. And the move towards chips was really spurred because imagine that you're, trying, you're in a space race with Russia and you're trying to go into space. In the early days, every fraction of a gram equated to so many tens of thousands of today's dollars that if you could put six transistors on one chip for the same weight, the same mass, you had a big benefit in terms of money. And Lockheed was building stuff for the military, like launching missiles out of submarines. NASA was heading into space. And they were the only ones who could afford to buy this new technology, where a single chip with a single decision-making device called a gate, three transistors maybe, would cost, of today's dollars, maybe 500 of today's dollars. Nobody could afford that. It takes a million to build a computer. How could you ever build a computer with uh, that price? So they weren't for normal people. They were for the military, the people who could pay for it, financed by the government. My dad, working at Lockheed, was close to the starting companies. He took me to a show when I was 10 years old, and there were booths showing off products of, you know, making components for electronic devices. And this one guy showed a picture that looked like a bunch of houses on a street looking down on it. And he said, these are six transistors. We're going to make a chip with six transistors on it. Wow, it might have been Gordon Moore himself that was showing me this when I was a young kid. How incredible to go back and have memories of seeing this such an important transition from the transistor on down. Everything often starts in one place and, and everything funnels out from it for decades and decades of development. So I was able to get some cosmetic reject transistors from some of the transistor companies and I learned, I accidentally picked up a journal in our house, and the journal talked about binary, a system of ones and zeros for mathematics. And I said, my God, these ones and zeros are as easy for a fifth grader as math in school is. You don't need complicated math. You don't need geometry, trigonometry, calculus, all these exotic things we've heard of. All you need is normal, a normal young student could understand everything about zeros and ones. And they had decision-making devices called gates decision-making devices that follow rules. And each one of them electronically was very, very simple to understand. And I said, my God, this is my secret for the rest of my life. I am going to love computers and everything about them. And I don't know why. I'm never going to have a job doing this. Jobs are only in some weird places called research, wherever those are. And so I'm never going to be working with computers. But God, it's so neat to study them and understand them. Well. One year for a science fair project, I took hundreds of transistors and resistors and diodes, pounded nails into a big piece of plywood, soldered all the transistors to the nails. Every transistor made one decision, one rule in the game of tic-tac-toe. Tic-tac-toe, you can never lose if you follow a good set of rules. If there's an X here and an X there and an O there, where do you move? It's all a set of rules that will guarantee you never lose, except you can be beaten psychologically. People can trick you into losing, but um, built that device. I had no idea that I was taking exactly the right steps up this nice, smooth ladder that leads up to the Apple II and things like that. Now, my rewards, why was I interested in these, this computer logic stuff? None of the kids in school did it. My parents didn't do it. I didn't do it with teachers. It was just my own interest. Well, there are two kinds of rewards. 
extrinsic rewards and intrinsic rewards. And extrinsic rewards are on the outside, the ones that people can see. They can see your title. They can see your salary. They can see how many yachts you have. They can see your awards, your grades in school. But the intrinsic rewards are the ones that are in your own head, and they matter the most. Who are you really? What are you really going to stand for? And what's really important to you? And, you know, the fact that you're getting satisfied with computers, learning about them, that's an intrinsic reward that's much more powerful than even grades in school. By high school, we had a great electronics teacher, great classes teacher, military guy. He wrote the course himself. We did more slide rule calculations in our electronics class in high school than you had in physics or chemistry. I mean, it was just wonderful for somebody like me, so mathematical, and I loved numbers, and I was the slide rule whiz in my high school. And um, Usually in electronics, it's like a vocational course, and the top academic students don't take it. But a few of us top academic students would take electronics, and we were the ones, you know, kind of more superior like engineers. Um, <laughs> the teacher, in my case, I had so much electronics experience from ham radio and a whole bunch of digital science fair projects, including adders, subtractors, and all that, that that my teacher said, you already know all the electronics here, and you're just going to play pranks and wire other people's radios up so they explode. So I've arranged for you to go down to a company once a week outside of the school. He went beyond the school boundaries. You know, I never saw any other teachers that did that. Most teachers say, here's what we have to teach. Here are our books, and here's what the learning is, and you go find the extra on your own. But this teacher, every year, helped a few students get into business, kind of on a co-op basis. So I got to go down to Sylvania once a week and program a thing called a computer. We didn't have computers in high school then. So this was, wow. I was like the most important person in the world. My dream in life, computers, I got to program one. What can a computer do? A million things a second. A computer can count a million times a second. How fast can a human being count? Figure it out, and it takes you, you know, two weeks if you don't go to sleep, and you might count to a million, but I doubt it. So this computer can do it in one second. How powerful. One of my first programs I wrote was the Knight's Tour, where a knight piece on a chessboard tries to hit every square exactly once and not twice. And then you get stuck and bouncing around randomly, and you back up, and you try a different approach, and back up and try a different approach, and you'll get the solution. And I wrote the program, and it would do a million things a second and get the answer. And nothing came out. And the next week, I printed chess boards, and I finally saw that my program was good, but it was going to take 10 to the 25th years to solve. Which is a very good early example of... Raw speed, raw power in a computer isn't how you solve a lot of problems that are simple and especially problems that are complex. You need good approaches that come from the mind. You need good methods, good algorithms. While I was down, I discovered that year, in my senior year of high school, I discovered mini computers, what they were about. Mini computers were big boxes with lights that had A0, A1, A2, A3, all these geeky sounding nomenclature. And it's a front panel, and it's like the old computers that you see glorified in movies, and you're afraid. If you walked up and you were a normal person, and maybe half the people in this audience are normal people, and half might be engineers or, or vice <laughs> versa. We might have some business people here, I'm told. So, um, so then you'd walk up, and you would say, I would not ever dare touch that machine because I wouldn't know one thing about one button that I'm pressing that somehow says, you know, arrow to memory or something. And um, so that's what these machines were. They were very sterile. They looked like they belonged on a factory floor. But I accidentally discovered a manual that described the architecture of one. Imagine that you have a lot of experience with lumber. And I had a lot of experience with logic at the time. And you have a design of, of a building with certain windows and doors and rooms. Well, you could theoretically start to put down the pieces of lumber you're familiar with and construct a drawing of that building. Similarly, I took chip manuals of the day, and chips were pretty weak back then, you know, one gate on a chip, and I would design on paper my version of this computer that I now had a description of its architecture, the PDP-8. And it took me quite a few weeks, quite a few tries, and on weekends I would shut the door in my room. I was a very shy person then, wouldn't involve anyone else, I'd sit on my white table, and I'd just start trying to teach myself, how would you design a computer? No books, no reference materials. They didn't sell books on how to make, how computers were made in stores back then. And I eventually designed this computer. 
And then I thought, wow, what about other mini computers? So a friend and I, I thought, I'm so interested in computers, but there's no books in the technical library. Where would you find a good technical library? Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. I hate to use the word. Um, Stanford Linear Accelerator Center had some of the brightest minds. They would surely have manuals on computers there. So a friend and I drove in on a Sunday so we wouldn't get caught. And we kind of figured out where the main building was. And we discovered that wherever real bright people work, they tend to leave doors unlocked. So, so we, every single Sunday we went there, we'd climb stairs and find a door unlocked somewhere. We'd get into the building, go to the library, and I would read magazines for engineers on computers. And I could fill out little cards and order manuals for the Varian mini computers of the day, for the Hewlett Packard mini computers of the day, for the digital equipment mini computers of the day. And every time I got a manual that described the architecture of a computer, close my door at home on a weekend, and start designing my version of it. And after a while, I made a game. How can I do this better and better and better? Kind of like seeking perfection. How can I be better than I ever was? Strange ideas in my head, ways to use parts of gates that were supposed to be something called a register, but use it as something else called an inverter, just because it will work, even though it's not designed that way. Everything I could to save parts. And I thought, engineering is all about efficiency. So many times we're looking for Output divided by input, getting the most out for the least in. And to me, that was, you, if something is very short and simple, be it a program, be it hardware, fewer parts was more valuable. And it just became a little game. And I got very, very good at this. I uh, looked at my designs, and they were like half as many chips as the companies that were shipping the computers. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, when you create energy, these days. Energy is one of the big engineering problems of the near future. It's like we've got to look at how can we get a little more efficiency, a little more energy out of some molecules, out of the sunlight, whatever, to you know, make some of the, the new advances, the green advances go. A company came out with a mini computer called, this company started up called Data General. They had the Nova mini computer. And it was one of those rectangular boxes with a front panel, switches for ones and zeros, and buttons to push them into memory and um, had a very different architecture than all the others. I sat down one weekend, closed my door, and started designing my chips into this computer, the Data General Nova, and it took half as many chips as all the other mini computers. And I was stunned, and I came to a realization, if you design an architecture exactly matching the parts that are available, you can use very few parts and have just as good a computer. And that stuck with me for the rest of my life. That was going to be my philosophy of what good design was, very few parts. I told my father, someday I'm going to own a 4K Nova computer so I can write programs. And he said, that'll cost as much as a house. And I said, I'll live in an apartment. <laughs> that was going to, I would rather have a computer in my life than a house. I was lucky to get either. Is it? <laughs> but, um, no, computers, well, Moore's Law took care of that. All righty, my first year of college, computer courses in most colleges, all but a very, very few, were graduate courses only. Introduction to computers was a graduate course. And I was enrolled in engineering, so I was allowed to take it. And wow, I got to write Fortran programs. It was a great course. I learned a lot. I got an A+. Plus, and I got to write Fortran programs. So I started writing programs that calculated tables of numbers. I had seven programs that calculated things like powers of two, Fibonacci numbers. They would print 60 pages of output and stop before I got kicked off the computer. And then punch out the cards so I could substitute some punch cards in, run it again, and get the next 60 pages in order. And the next 60 pages. And the numbers were growing until they were longer than a whole page. And I was piling up reams of output in my dorm room. Seven programs a day, three runs a day on the supercomputer at our campus, um, times 60 pages each. And they stopped my programs from running. And I got put on probation for what I call computer abuse. But it turns out I didn't realize, I thought when you signed up for a computer class, you got to use the computer. Unfortunately, I didn't realize that it was a little, there was a little structure in the background called budgets. And I ran our class five times over budget <laughs> for computer use, and it was more than out-of-state tuition. So um, that was a good year because electronics, people that don't know electronics, you can have an awful lot of fun with them. Or imagine if they don't know computers, the little tricks you can put onto their screen that might come up and what is going on here, the fun you can have. 
Well, I went down to Radio Shack and bought a high-speed transistor. I wound a coil and put a little capacitor on, designed up a little tiny, tiny transmitter that would jam TV signals. And the black and white TVs in our dorm, it would jam just real good. I tested it. And so I went over to this hall, Libby Hall, and down in the basement, they had a color TV. And um, sit in the back, and I finally jammed it a little, and it fuzzed up the picture. It didn't really jam it. It just fuzzed it up. A friend of mine in the front row, without even any planning, whacked the TV. So I made it go good. And then after a while, I would jam it, and he would whack it, and it would go good. And it was amazing to watch this effect, because I hadn't planned it, but it was like a psychology experiment. And for two weeks, they put one person next to the TV set every night. Whenever the picture went bad, he had to turn the controls or whack it till it went good. And sometimes, one time, they held the antenna up in the air to make it good. And eventually, they had to stand on a chair. Another time, one guy had his hand on the middle of the screen. Three guys were fixing the TV. One guy had his hand on the middle of the screen and a foot up in the air on a chair. And I made it go good. And eventually, they relaxed, and it went bad. And they said, put your bodies back where they were. Because by now, they were sure that where their bodies were made the TV work. Eventually, he put his hand on the TV, and it worked. And he put his foot down on the floor, and it failed. And he put his foot back up on the chair, and it worked. And he turned to the audience and announced, it's a grounding effect. I think he was an electrical engineer. Um, because they were going to charge, they acted like they were going to charge me so much to go back. They scared me away from that school. And, and the next year, I went to um, college in Cupertino. And a friend of mine worked in the computer room with the IBM 360 Model 40. And he had copied the key to the room. So we would go in at midnight. To me, have you ever watched Happy Gilmore, any of you? The ball wants to go in the hole. The hole is your home. Well, a computer sitting there at night, unused, wants to compute, doesn't it? <laughs> so we'd go in at midnight and put paper in front of the terminals to, that shows the jobs. And I'd run programs late into the night, two, three, four in the morning. Then we'd close things up and go back home. So that was a great year. I just wanted to write every program I could, take every course I could, even ones that wouldn't carry credit to Berkeley. Um, next year, I didn't have money for Berkeley, so I took a year off to work and earn the money for my third year of college. Walked into a door by accident, and they were building a medium-sized computer. This computer was going to run the DMV, two of them, for the next 20 years. It was that good a computer. And I got a job there programming. And while I was there, I mentioned to one of the engineers how I used to design computers back in high school. I would design all the mini computers. And he said, did you ever build one? I said, no, I could never get the parts. I could never afford them. And he said, well, he had connections with chip companies, and he would get me some parts if I designed a computer. So I went home and designed a very minimal computer and came back the next day, and he gave me the parts. And um, I went home, and it took, took about a week or two to wire it up down the street. This friend of mine, we were wiring it in his garage. He said, you've got to meet this guy, Steve Jobs. He goes to the same high school as us, and he's into the things you're into. He, likes, he knows digital electronics and things that have counters and numbers on them. And he likes to play pranks at school. So Steve came over, and we're sitting there on the sidewalk sizing each other up. You know, he played a couple of nice pranks, you know, with phones on some lines that were in tunnels under the school that I didn't know about. And I had tons and tons of my own pranks. And then we talked about our electronics, and I talked about my computer designs and all that. And so we, were, we became best friends for the next eight years. Um, he had a nice home and family, his mother, father, sister. I didn't realize they were adopted. I didn't realize he didn't like his dad. His dad was always showing us lasers from where he worked and interesting stuff. I thought he, the sort of stuff that you'd be interested in. And I thought his dad was really nice, but Steve didn't get along with him that well. Um, Steve had worked selling surplus parts at a local surplus parts dealer. And he, and he would sometimes discover somebody that had a bunch of parts for six cents that he could sell for six dollars each. And he'd make a purchase of 100 parts and, and make money like that. And I thought, whoa, that just sounds a little wrong. You can get it for six cents and sell it for six dollars. Why wouldn't you tell the person you're selling it to what it cost you? And another thing that Steve did back in high school, he talked to me that for the first meeting we ever had, he talked to me about how he and some friends had made a movie, frame by frame, claymation, animation movie. So, you know, you never hear about that. When you hear about Pixar, yeah, he did, um, it started way back early in his life. Um, he'd also read a book, and he said that there were a few special people, the Einsteins and the Newtons, that moved our progress forward in the world. 
moved life forward, and there were only very few of those. And in this book, all the rest of the people kind of didn't matter. They didn't make any difference to how history went. And Steve always talked like he wanted to be one of those special people that were the ones, you know, moving the world in a forward direction. Um, well, you know, and, and, I, and I kind of agree with that. You know what? If you, um, you, know, if you don't want to solve problems or move the world forward, you're not going to. You have to want to. Having the want and the desire, the inspiration to do something is more important. I taught elementary school for eight years after Apple. I did it quietly with no press, but it was more important to inspire the students to want to learn than it was to actually teach them material. Um, the company that I was working for, uh, making that great computer that they sold to the state of California, went bankrupt. There was a big recession. They went bankrupt. They had a great computer, all done, operating systems, languages, incredible hardware. And it was difficult to understand, how can you make a product successfully, a good product, and still go bankrupt? That always bothered me. Um, hit, it, hit it off to a great year at Berkeley. Oh, my God. A um, uh, little, bit, little bit on the prank side. This was back in the Vietnam days, and we had demonstrations that came down, you know, Shattuck and, and Bancroft and broke every single window and every single store. And there were, the cops were shooting rubber bullets, and it was always fun to find one. And I, I kept trying, me, I kept trying, you know, I like to do the things you can never get a chance to do again in your life. So I always wanted to go out there when they were about to throw a tear gas canister, I always wanted to run over and get somebody to take my picture by the tear gas canister going off. <laughs> never quite succeeded. Now, did I ever have an engineering schedule for Berkeley? I, I was now a junior, and I could sign up for the courses I wanted, so I took couple of grad courses in hardware design and a couple in software design. They were all in the same room in Quarry Hall, all four of my courses. And on Monday and Wednesday, I'd go to this classroom, the same classroom, sit in the same chair for two classes in a row. And Tuesday and Thursdays, I'd go to that same chair and sit for two classes in a row. And none of my classes started before noon, always in the same chair. You just couldn't do, do, write that into a book. Um, Steve, Steve Jobs was, was coming up a lot to visit me in the dorms, and I'd drive down to him, and we had discovered these little devices that if you put tones into an American telephone, you could make free calls all over the world. And it was a little startling, and it wasn't like, you know, I was careful that I wouldn't make any of my own phone calls that way, but I sure did explore the system. How far can you get? How do you get to these international operators and talk them into connecting you through satellite to another international operator? And around the world, and you talk in one phone and hear yourself a second later, it was just so interesting. <laughs> so that was the first time Steve took one of my designs and he said, let's sell it. And so, so we actually sold some of those here. Um, after that year at Berkeley, I had totaled my car. It's a great page in my book, The, the Night I Met Captain Crunch. Um, I'm not going to go through it. I'm not going to go through it. It's the best, best few pages in the book um, for a great story. But I, I, I didn't have the money. I totaled my car and didn't have the money for my fourth year of college. So I went to work for a year, supposedly one year. Didn't drop out of college. And the hottest product in the world... I managed to buy one with all the money I did have. It was the HP 35 scientific calculator, the first handheld scientific calculator of all time, the one that was going to put slide rules out of existence in a couple of years. This was an every single engineer, every scientist had to get this calculator because instead of slide rules, you could type in 10-digit numbers and see digital answers and get them instantly and immediately and accurately. And this, for engineers, this product changed the world. Somehow... HP heard that I was some hot computer designer. And they brought me in for interviews and hired me as an engineer designing the calculators. So what an incredible chance in life to be on, you know, the hot moving products of the world, to get to work there. It's like if you loved Apple products so much and you got a job at Apple. So my job was designing the digital logic inside of chips and then laying out, doing some chip layouts, actually. And I would go and use the computer. We had one... Hewlett Packard mini computer and teletypes and big apparatus that we all shared. So 40 of us engineers would sign up for time slots, get on the computer, run our programs, and I would write simulations that simulated my designs, ones and zeros, bit by bit, and see how they came out and make sure they work. So um, that's what I would do on that computer. And I kind of, you know, would have loved to have my own computer, but that comes a hair later. Our calculators at Hewlett Packard used what was called reverse Polish notation. Anybody know what reverse Polish notation is? You know, anybody who's been through computer software or 
algorithm expression um, solutions knows that RPN, you put in, if you want to add two numbers, you put the two numbers in first, and then you say add them. And that's how our calculators work. And it was like things that computer scientists do who are writing computer languages. So we thought our calculators are more sophisticated, more computer science, more powerful and macho than normal calculators where you say two plus three. And um, we had a big equation on a card that you, we could solve with our calculators, but boy, was it hard. I'd try it over and over. It had so many subterms, you know, this minus that squared. And it was kind of like the big statistics problems. I could solve it on my calculator. Texas Instruments introduced a new calculator. They came out with a calculator that used parentheses instead of reverse Polish notation. Parentheses, five plus three, parentheses, times six, and that's, the parentheses told you what order to do things in for a long equation. And we laughed at it. We said parentheses make it a toy. The same way people were going to someday say graphics makes the Macintosh a toy. And we laughed at it in Hewlett Packard. And they brought the calculator over by my cubicle and about six engineers were standing around and one marketing guy. And I said, hey, I'll try the big equation. We had this big card. I said, I'll try it because I thought of myself as being pretty smart. And I sat down there and looked at the equation and saw, here's the term you do first. So I have to hit about six parentheses, or is it seven? And I'm thinking, there's no way in the world I'm ever going to get this straight. No human could do this. And I did something that's very important that a lot of people have trouble doing. Cleared my head out. You pretend you don't know anything. What would you do? There has to be a way. Wait a minute. Why don't I type it in from left to right? I typed in the equation from left to right as fast as I could go, guessing if square root was prefix or postfix, first or last, and got the right answer the first time. And the other engineers were kind of stunned. How did he do that? And I held it, handed it to each of them, and I said, type it in from left to right. I couldn't get one other engineer to type it in from left to right, parentheses and everything. They all wanted to use the skill that they had built up of looking at a complicated expression, figuring out which part to do first and which part to do second, and wanting to do them in that order. You don't want to give up a skill sometimes, so you miss spotting when something comes along that's easier and simpler. You know, why have two languages, one for the calculator, one for handwritten expressions? Steve Jobs around this time wanted to go to Reed College because one of those special people in the world that got a Nobel Prize was at Reed College. And I drove Steve up to Reed College in Portland, Oregon, visited him quite a few times um, in the next months. And the first day he got there, he brought a card to me. He said, look, here's the classes they're telling me I have to take. And I looked at it, and it was literature, you know, and calculus and, you know, or some kind of math and, and history. It was the normal stuff that you take. And I said, yeah, that's what you get when you go to college. And he said, oh, no, no, he only he thought you'd go to college and you'd take Shakespeare and quantum physics and all these neat things. And, uh, and so he didn't go to classes for the first week. He just sat in this tent with his girlfriend in the dorm. And I thought, this, I could never do that. I could never be that brave. Well, Steve was more like a true hippie of the day, a counterculturist, kind of going through life with a lot of friends and everybody lives on nothing and has almost nothing, no money, and just some sandals and lives the very, very, very... <laughs> Simple life, and so he and, and me. I admired all the counterculture thinking of those days, but I didn't become it. I was still going to be middle of the road, feet on the ground, an engineer, have a home someday, have a family. But I really admired the thinking. My head was very free and open. So um, uh, he lived. He somehow talked them into letting him stay at Reed College for a couple of years with no money for dorms and no money for tuition. But they liked him. If you're persuasive and people like you, you can get a lot of things. And he, he always got lots of things easy by, by being who he is. And he's very um, impressive and intelligent. Well, I'm back at Hewlett Packard, and my love in life is engineering. And I'm so shy and such a geek that I'm never going to have a girlfriend or a wife. So when I came home from work on calculators, I went to work on other projects that I loved in electronics. I just did it. I worked on hotel movie systems for friends. I did all of this for free. I would just take jobs and fly to LA and design some digital stuff for the first hotel movie systems when nobody had ever seen a movie in a hotel in, the, in their life. I got to work on the early VCRs before anybody ever saw a VCR. The first consumer VCR was not the Sony Betamax. It was an American company called Cartrivision. Built them into some Sears TVs, went bankrupt right away. And we Hewlett Packard engineers could go down and buy them in San Jose for 60 bucks each a color VCR when black and white ones cost a thousand bucks for schools. Incredible, incredible opportunity. Um, I started the first dial-a-joke in the San Francisco Bay Area. 
you'll meet a lot of people who have started companies, but this is the only time in your life you'll meet someone who was the first person to start a dial a joke in a regional area where you can dial a number. I take credit for that one. <laughs> you dial this number, and I would tell a Polish joke. Hello, thank you for dialing dial a joke. And then the Polish American Congress complained, and I said, what if I switch into Italian jokes? And they said, that's fine. <laughs> this was before political correctness. And um, dial a joke, well, that's, I did this in 1972 when it was illegal in the United States to own, use, or purchase your own telephone. It was illegal in the United States to own, use, or purchase your own answering machine. So, um, so it was, I had to lease the one machine that the phone company offered, and it cost as much as my apartment rental. You know, imagine you're just out of college, and you're paying for an apartment, and then you have to pay again that amount just for an answering machine. But I, want, I was so into humor, I wanted to run the first dial a joke, and I ran it for a couple of years. And because it was like a chat room, I was anonymous. All these people were calling, they didn't know who I was. And so I could come home from work and take calls live, and I actually met my first wife that way. <laughs> and prankster as I am, I, the first thing I said to her was, I can hang up before you, and I did. <laughs> Steve Jobs, you know, oh, oh, before that, um, I went into a bowling alley with Alice, and there was a Pong game. The first time ever I saw a little TV screen playing a game, and I, my jaw opened, I couldn't believe it television set can play a game? Who ever heard of that? Pinball games were always had, all we had before that. And as I stared at it, I said, I could build one of those because I know digital electronics and I know television signals from high school. I can build my own Pong. I'm going to build my own. I couldn't afford one, so I had to build it. And I did, and it was, you know, very few chips. And I even put in a couple of proms from work and programmed them so that when you missed the ball, it spelled a four-letter word like heck. <laughs> Steve Jobs came back from Oregon, and, he, and he's the sort of person, I told him all about Pong and everything, he went down to Atari and got a job. <laughs> so that quickly. And so he was in there kind of like fixing up the machines they designed. He wasn't quite engineer level. And he came to me one day and he said, Nolan Bushnell, who owns Atari, wants you to design a game. He's sick and tired of his own engineers designing games with 100 chips, 120 chips, 150 chips, 180 chips. He wants small ones, and he knows you design things small. And, he, and Steve described to me this one-player Pong game called Breakout. And I said, yeah, I, oh my God, it'd be the greatest thing in my life to design a game that people are going to play in bowling alleys and stuff. Kids are going to play. How incredible. And Steve said, well, there's a hitch. We have to build it in four days and nights. It wasn't software back then. It was hardware. Little chips with voltages that went high and low, and you had to hook wires to make other chips go high and low to get signals into a TV set that showed up as balls and paddles. That was a six-man-month job. So four days and nights, I didn't think I could do it, but I sat down and started designing. We didn't sleep for four days, either one of us. We both got the sleeping sickness, mononucleosis. We delivered a working breakout game to Atari. While I was there, I was kind of, you know how you are when you're falling asleep and you're hardly awake and your mind's drifting? It's almost like you're, like, uh, I don't know, it's almost like you're hypnotized, sort of hallucinogenic or something. All the, the games in Atari at that time were built with black and white TV sets, little dots going in black and white. And I went to the factory floor, and this one game had a bunch of mylar on the screen, red, green, blue, orange. And as the ball went across the screen, it was changing colors like a rainbow. And I was just mesmerized by this color effect. Color is so important in the world. And then into my head popped an idea of a way to take a little $1 chip, spin it around at the right speed, and get all sorts of signals out that would look like color on an NTSC television, or American television. So I filed that idea away. Next thing, after breakout, Steve Jobs and I went to visit a friend who said he had something big to show us, and he's down in a basement typing on the big teletype machine, and he says, I'm playing chess with a computer in Boston. And he was on the ARPANET, the early forerunner of today's internet. And he brought up a list of computers, Stanford, Berkeley, UCLA, you know, Illinois, um, um, MIT was on there, about 12 computers, and you could log on. It's that getting far away thing that makes you super powerful and a you know, superhuman. And I said, as I, I drooled, and I said, I have to have this. So I went home, and instead of designing a game that put balls and paddles on my home TV, and I, I had no money at all. Steve Jobs and I were in our young 20s, realized we had no savings account, 
We had no checking account, really. We had no cars we owned. We had zero. So the only output device I ever had was my television because it was free. I already owned it. Televisions didn't have video in in those days. You had to take it apart, scope around, find where to put the video signal in, inject it, and you'd get a picture on your screen. And um, I just redesigned my game. I, I designed a new product that would put letters of the alphabet, words, on my television set. And then I bought a keyboard for a huge amount of money, and I could type, and through a modem that I built, I could type to that computer in Boston or Stanford or wherever or Berkeley, and I could type and run the programs that were for guests, and it would type back to my television set. And this, I was so happy, and I hardly ever used it. I just wanted to actually create it more than I needed to use it. Steve Jobs came along and said, why don't we sell this design to a local time-sharing computer company? And we did, and got some money for it. So... <laughs> Um, it, was, it was a TV terminal of my own. Now a friend came to me and said a group of people are getting together that are interested in things like TV terminals, video terminals. I thought, wow, I'm so shy. I never talked to anyone, but I love showing off my devices, and then people talk to me. So I said, I'll go. It was the Homebrew Computer Club. And we started in Menlo Park. It was a rainy night. The garage door was open. We're, and everybody was talking about one of these geeky-looking front panel little computers based on a microprocessor. And I had not followed microprocessors, so I felt very shy. I was the only one in the room that didn't know what this meeting was about. It was about the Altair 8800 thing that called itself a computer, but it was really just a glorified microprocessor with switches and lights for ones and zeros and buttons you could push to get them into memory. And I thought back, I mean, I built that computer five years before. But, uh, so I took home a data sheet for a microprocessor, and that night, I found out that a microprocessor was roughly the mini computers I used to design in high school. I said, I'm in business, oh my God, that computer I wanted my whole life. Now I see the path to get it. And I took my video terminal and I redesigned it to put a microprocessor in some memory, a little startup program like our Hewlett Packard calculators so I could now type to my own computer and it could type to my TV set. And in the, in the Intel world, the other machines that were coming out, the hobby kits, were usually based on the Intel chips, and Bill Gates had written a basic for it. We knew his name. You know, this little hobby community, a few people here, a few people there, hardly anyone, you know, not even thousands of people in the country, maybe, followed these new developing microcomputers, and Bill Gates' name was famous. He had written a basic. And I thought, wow, if I write a basic for my microprocessor, I'll get famous. So... I had never programmed in BASIC, by the way. I had to learn the language, write a syntax charts. I'd never taken a course in doing this, but I'd read a lot, of, read some books on it and managed to write my own BASIC. And I'd go down to the club and pass out my schematics. And I'd pass out my code listings, no copyright notices. Give it away for free because our club members were young people, the people like yourselves. It weren't, wasn't moneyed people, it wasn't CEOs, it was the people who were technicians that knew computer logic, that wanted their own computer, didn't want the company to own it, and they wanted to prove that if you can program, you can do more for the company than the CEO. And I wanted to help these social dreams come to reality, that kids with an interactive book would now use 100% of their brain instead of 10%, so I gave away my schematics so that everybody in our club could build their own computer. Unfortunately, a lot of people aren't skilled at building things and soldering wires. So Steve Jobs came along then, and he saw the interest in my design, and he said, why don't we start a company, and what we'll do is we'll make a PC board for $20 and sell it for $40 to make life easy for the people who want your computer. And I didn't, I, we'd have to invest a certain amount of money, and I didn't think we'd get it back. And he said, yeah, but for once in our lives, the two of us will have our own company. And... Um, so I said, next I said, well, everything I do belongs to Hewlett Packard, my employer. I'm never going to leave Hewlett Packard. I'm going to be an engineer for life. This is an engineering company that respects engineers, that came from engineers. We engineers at the bottom of the org chart actually come up with the new ideas for products. And I went. I implored my company, Hewlett Packard, to please, please build a machine that looks like a typewriter that you can actually run programs on. And they turned me down, the first of five turndowns. So Steve and I, um, I sold my most valuable possession, my HP 65 calculator, Steve sold something, and we invested in a PC board. The next thing that happened was Steve called me at work one day, and he said, I got an order for $50,000. My salary was 24000 
This was scary. This was like big time. Oh, my God. We're more than just a little fun thing at home. So I went back to Hewlett Packard's legal department. They circulated it. I got turned down again. And we were off um, into basically starting Apple. We had the garage going for the next half year. It's called the garage. We didn't do any designs in the garage. We didn't do any sales in the garage. The telephone was in Steve's bedroom. It's just that you had to have a place to gather. Our friends would gather and talk about the computer and try out a new program on a bench in the garage. The computers weren't manufactured in the garage. They were manufactured at a place in Santa Clara. We would drive them to the garage, test them, put them in a white box, drive them to the store. As I said, we had no money, Steve and I. So what we got was we had 30 days credit on all the parts to build the computers. Once we got the computers out of Santa Clara and tested them, um, we drove them to the store and we got paid cash on delivery. So the store was taking the credit. And that's how we were able to run this Apple One thing. It's like sometimes you can have dreams that are far out and cost a lot of money to, to accomplish. And it might cost, and if you had a little bit less money, you can do a little bit less of that dream. But basically, stick with whatever money you have, do what you can. It's a step forward that will get you onto the other steps. Within, um, so many people would come by. Steve's dad was always in the garage working with his laser stuff. And his sister, we'd pay her a dollar a board to plug the chips into the sockets sometimes. She'd make some money. And that was a lot back then. And she was making a lot of money. And Dan Cockey was a friend who came by. And he learned how to test them and find some of the, fix some of the problems on the boards. And a couple of high schoolers that we met at the Homebrew Computer Club would come by because they were interested that we had the computer that was going to be affordable. Within three months, I designed really a computer from the ground up, the Apple II. And for some reason, it wound up half as many parts, 10 times the computer. The f nobody would have ever expected color to be in a computer. It was just a shock to the world that it could be done at an affordable cost in that year. Nobody would have expected graphics. What do I mean by graphics? Well, you could say type a number like 7 into a memory location, and a blue square would pop up on your TV. And instantly, you could realize if you just manipulate all the numbers in memory, you can have colors moving around on your set, graphics. We had high resolution, meaning pixels on a screen. That long ago with the Apple II, and we knew that this product was a big winner, so we didn't give it out for free. And we started looking for the money to build it because we knew we could sell 1,000 of them. How do you build 1,000 of them if they cost $250,000 $250 each to build? You need $250,000. It's like a million of today's dollars at least. We went to Commodore and tried to get them to give us a bunch of money. Steve started talking real big money. Give us a few hundred thousand bucks and give us some jobs and give us some stock. And I was so embarrassed. I'm thinking, how can you ask for that? I mean, my salary is only 25000 You know, I've designed two computers in a year. And it's like um, just good engineering is all it is. And they turned us down and built their own. Everyone we showed this Apple II to decided to get into the business. We went to Atari. They were friends of ours, but they had their hands full with the first home pong game, so they turned us down. We went to venture capitalists, and we couldn't speak like businessmen. Neither one of us had any business experience or any business schooling. Like I told you, how young we were. So that didn't go, and we ran into this guy, Mike Markula. He was an angel, and he came across. He figured that this was going to be a big thing. These computers were going to be the next big explosion in, in the technical world in terms of money, and we were going to be a huge billion-dollar company in a few months. And he knew how to run business. He'd retired on a stock option. So he would invest in us, but I had to leave Hewlett Packard. And that was a very difficult decision for me because I decided I wanted to work for Hewlett Packard for the rest of my life as an engineer. I've designed on the side, just at night, I've designed two computers and built them and cassette tape interfaces. I wrote a basic. I did all these other interfaces and stuff. And why don't I just keep doing that on the side and keep my job at Hewlett Packard as well? And Mike Markla said, no, I had to leave Hewlett Packard, and he gave me until Tuesday to decide. And on Tuesday, I, you know, I was one of those people, I grew up very independent my whole life, and I wasn't going to be influenced by money. So on Tuesday, I turned him down and said, nope, I'm going to keep stay at Hewlett Packard and design computers for myself at night. And Steve went into a frenzy, Steve Jobs. He caught, got all my relatives to start calling me, and all my friends, take the money, take the money. And one friend finally said the right thing. He said, look, you can start this new company and be an engineer and stay an engineer and you don't have to go into management, you don't have to run it, and that's what I needed to hear. Because at that point, I was the sort of person that could never really run a company. I couldn't step on other people's um, toes. I think we're about done, but um, I'll, I'll give a couple of the good highlights real quickly. 
The Apple II was introduced, started selling very well, kind of took over this little hobby computer world, but it was a completely built product. Take it out of the box and start typing on it. It used a cassette tape to store your programs. One year, after one year, we were allowed personal computers to go to the CES show in Las Vegas. Las Vegas, the city of lights, I'd never been to it. And I wasn't gonna be going, but I said in a staff meeting, I said, if we have a floppy disk, can we show it? And Mike Markula said, yes. That gave me two weeks. If I design a floppy disk in two weeks, I get to go to Las Vegas. You can't get better motivation than that. <laughs> the real breakthrough came from a person trying to write a checkbook program with checks month by month and realized that he had really a financial forecasting tool, the first spreadsheet called VisiCalc. Once VisiCalc was out, an Apple II plus VisiCalc to a small businessman, they could do their work in in two hours, three hours, that would take them 10 years by pencil and paper, and they were just buying them by the hordes, and we were a big, um, lucky technical success story. Um, after, after Apple was successful, and I had a plane crash while working on the Macintosh project, um, I did go back to finish my college, and I, I came back to Berkeley, and I uh, enrolled over in the main building under a fake name, Rocky Raccoon Clark, to finish, finish my study, so I got my diploma in that name. And I did other things that I intended my whole life to do. I did go back and I taught fifth grade for eight years and things like that because just wanted, how do you stay yourself? Um, I'm ready for question and answers. I'm not sure how much time we have left. Probably running a little late. So thank you, thank you. Here's how it works. Okay. Here's how it works. If you have a question, raise your hand, and somebody will bring you a microphone. I'll identify you for them. And it, it, it can certainly be current questions. I'm up on all the latest, uh, you know, Apple stuff. Hi. Um, what advice would you give to new innovators? Because many new companies tend to, like, either boom, and then somehow they kind of just, like, you know, fade away, and no one hears about them anymore, or they get absolved by a much bigger company. So what advice would you give to people who kind of have the same passion and dream like you, mm -hmm. like you did yourself when you were younger? Yeah, everybody who's just as smart and passionate and excited about what they're doing doesn't have necessarily the huge big successes like Apple and Google and all that, and you, you can't expect it, but you can, you gotta keep trying. Um, one of the things I wish that a lot of the big companies, once they get successful, even if they buy smaller ones, I wish they could identify the people on the inside that have some neat things going. Why didn't Hewlett Packard spin me off and just invest? They couldn't do my product. They couldn't do it because of their corporate culture. Their corporate culture wasn't open to new products. They had to be finely done engineering, very finished products. But they should have been sensitive to other things that were good. A lot of engineers came to me and said, the Apple II, this is the best product I've ever seen in my life. I mean, they should have found a way to spin it off and own part of it and give it a different name and an ongoing existence. It's not done very much. Hewlett Packard did one very, very good thing to help the young inside innovators, and it came from Hewlett and Packard themselves in the early days. They had a policy that any engineer who designed something on their own could get parts out of the storeroom for it with their supervisor's approval. So they figured that your intelligence, it was a part, another way of funding your own um, education. Right here. Well, we're gonna go in whatever order we go in. <laughs> Two questions. Uh, one of them we were talked about when you were on This Week in Twit's um, podcast at the Apple Store. Where do I get good laser pointers is number one. The best laser pointers for the best price, dealextreme.com. Thank you. And Awful laser pointers in some weird colors, but very expensive, uh, wickedlasers.com or biglasers.com. Cool. And the, the other question is, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges now in technology and in innovation that engineers and other technology architects need to look at solving? Is it approaches, architectures, or is it a combination thereof? Yeah, I don't th see any real, I mean, critical areas. I see we're making big breakthroughs in especially um, foldable displays. I think that's going to be great. Maybe we can wear clothes someday or have Google Earth on a real globe. Um, I, you know, I see things that I like and have my own interests in, photonics being one of them. I'd love to see little gates, those little decision-making gates done only with photons, no electricity involved. Run some fiber optics into a chip and fiber optics out and there's no electricity at all. Um, love to see that happen because the heat goes away and you can run a lot faster and not run into the heat problems, although you have dimension problems. Um, robotics, I love, I love robotics. 
and I think in terms of, you know, artificial intelligence, how small the steps are that we've taken so far, you know, we always well, we show something off that'll s seem impressive, but what if you think about the idea of a robot making a cup of coffee? I could go into your house and make a cup of coffee. You could go into mine and make a cup of coffee, but if you think it out in your head, what it would take, all the steps that you did and how were you able to do it, and part of it's by having made a lot of coffee in your life and been in a lot of kitchens in your life, that robot has got to almost live a long life of learning to be able to do it. You can't program these things directly. Okay, well, uh, in the back. First of, all, first of all, I just want to say uh, I respect you very much. You're one of the greatest innovators of all time, I think. Um, secondly, uh, the question is, um, how do you view the shift from uh, consumer electronics computers specifically into more consumer media, for example, the, the iPhone or the, the iPod. Um, not that Apple has banned in the Macintosh sector, but there's definitely more of a shift towards that. Well, you know what? The sort of electronics projects that you have, we have the skills to build have been pretty much consistent. Back in the time of Edison, we may not have had computers so much, but you know, working on telephones, audio, phonographs, movie project, movie theater, the, the categories tend to stay the same thing. And so if you, once you have skills in that area and you can think of a good product, how does a company like Apple, yeah, come out with something that's not a computer? Um, think about this. All, of the, all over the world, music devices were being put out and being manufactured. You could buy them, and you had to transfer the files from a computer. So they were becoming like computer accessories. What Apple did was very strange, and it's in line with Apple's um, corporate philosophies that carry over to products which is we try to take all of the geekness, all of the engineering away from the user so they don't have to know any of it. We built the first music device that was not a music device. It didn't have files and structure that you had to learn. You simply plugged it in your computer and you know, Apple, Apple controlled all the elements. Apple, Apple could control the experience because they had the store, they had the operating system, they had the application, they had the hardware, they had the, the iTunes app, and they had the iPod. So you just plugged it in, and invisibly, the music was in your ear. You didn't really have to think. And that's a lot of what we, what we do that with. Um, the iPhone is another example of only wanting to make excellent products that you research and you try every approach in the world and just reject them, reject them, reject them until you get something that is just so outstanding good that anybody would drool over it and say, I have to have it. You know, and that's just Apple doesn't, uh, Steve Jobs in particular does, believes that we've only lost money when we've built junk that was so lousy we couldn't sell it. Um, do you plan to invent anything new? Or are you working on something? Are you I, I plan, I, I'm actually always close to people inventing things. Doing the sort of engineering I used to do, I was one of those ones that for 20 hours a day and I'd wake up in dreams with solutions all the time. I did, even in high school for mathematics, for classes, anything, just go to sleep thinking about it, wake up and write it down. But uh, I can't do that. Name. You know, 20 hours a day concentrate on engineering. I have a lot of public appearance stuff to this day. I have family, I have children, I have um, other duties in the world and not the time. That's kind of like why the, the new companies that come out of nowhere, the startups, you know, be it um, you, um, you know, Facebook or whatever, or Google, they come from young people who kind of haven't been there in the system very long. You know, Apple, we, we came from almost nowhere, and, and after a while, you just get older and you go into management. It becomes a lot easier. It's <laughs> difficult to remain a very precise engineer where everything has to be so perfect that nobody can do it better than you. That's, that's a lot of intense, you know, you feel stress and mental work in your head. You can only do it when you're young. So, so I guide projects now, and I've had a few startup companies working in pro areas like GPS and remote controls, the first, the first um, programmable remote controls. I did those just because I wanted to. I love little startups with a few people talking about ideas. Now I like to meet with even high school kids or just out of high school talking about ideas, where to build something. And usually what they're missing, there's so many people now that want to be an entrepreneur and start a company, but, and they have ideas, but they don't have the engineering and the product <laughs> done. We were lucky when we started Apple, we had the whole thing. Oh, hi. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, <laughs> my question is, what is the joke today? What's the joke today? <laughs> What's your favorite joke? Or the the joke? Oh, I, um, let's see. I tend to make up jokes when they come to me. Oh, yeah. One came to me earlier today, and I can't remember what it was. 
Um, I said it. Uh, sorry, I played a prank. I told you the prank that I played on my assistant. I mean, I, I played it on actually the engineering professors here. They think that she walked out of her appendectomy today. So um, that'll... What? Ask Kathy. My comedian friend. Friend. You're going to be seeing an awful lot of me in next year's My Life on the D-List reality TV show. Emmy award-winning show. An awful lot. I take her to Bob's Big Boy in Burbank and <laughs> donate computers to schools in Mexico. We do an awful lot together, yeah. And some big surprises, but I can't say everything. <laughs> yeah, she's real smart, real smart. Hi. Uh, very, very simple question. Why name your company Apple? That question comes up all the time. Why are we named Apple? Um, I remember picking Steve Jobs up at the airport in San Francisco when he flew back from... Portland, and we're driving down. He says, I got a great name for the company, Apple Computer. And right away, the biggest record company in the world, one of the biggest names that was known to young people our age, was Apple Records for the Beatles. I said, what about Apple Records? And he said, well, they're a record company. We're a computer company. And I said, that's all it takes? <laughs> and he said, yeah. So I trusted, okay. We both tried to think up strong technical names. Steve himself did. You know, in the car, we would try to think up better names, but nothing would ever beat Apple. Now, when we raised the big money to really start as a real company with the Apple II, we hired a PR agency. The agency came and told us the name Apple has to go because it doesn't symbolize, it doesn't speak of power, of computing a lot, of doing a lot of stuff. And Steve and I just held our ground. We said, no, computers are now coming to the homes. They're coming to a new class of people. And an Apple has a good, is a good symbol in the home. And, you know, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And an apple for the teacher. And apples are fruit and they're healthy and they're great symbol. <laughs> so we hung on to it. And then, then we got the PR agency went into designing logos that we selected. And, um, so it was uh, back in those days, there was no big money in this business either. So when there's no big money, any name's okay. If it sounds interesting, that's a good enough reason. Yeah, not to open a can of worms, but... Why did Microsoft become who they are, and when are they going to go away? Well, yeah, what? Okay. All righty. We'll have one more question after this one. But um, Microsoft, well, as I mentioned, Bill Gates actually started out as, as a brilliant programmer, but instantly went into being a businessman, buying something here, selling it for more there with, you know, subscriptions and making a lot of money off that. Um, there was a point in time with our Apple II where we dealt with Microsoft to write some application software for us and a floating point basic for us. And they were very cooperative and they were much smaller than Apple. We didn't think that much of them at the time. But the world was changing to where software was going to be more important. And you could buy those Intel machines everywhere in the world. Every manufacturer made Intel machines and only one manufacturer made the Apple II. And so we lost a huge amount of market share due to that. We kept our prices high. And um, it could have been a mistake, but it could have been the right thing to do. And how can you go back and try to point a finger and say it was right or it was wrong? Microsoft became very big, but they were trying to give the world new tools that it didn't have, computing tools. You know, a lot of people get, get their best out of it. I mean, when I think of what's the worst thing about Microsoft stuff, well, a lot of people fall in love with Apple stuff. And, you know, if you want to be passionate about the machine you own, like a car, or if you want to feel special, it's probably, you're probably a Macintosh person. Um, most, a lot of left brain industries, though, are forced into a PC. You can only get a lot of software for accounting on a PC, for l lawyers, legal on a PC, and for engineering. A lot of the software is only on a PC. So that kind of directs you. But your own personal choice... Um, our, we feel if we keep making good products, people will learn and find out. And, of course, I do worry about spam. And, like, I saw the slash dot thing last week where somebody was suggesting that if your computer is sending spam because it got taken over by some spammer and it's a zombie, well, then you should be taken offline until you can get a certificate, prove yourself, take a test or something that you can manage the operating system you own because it's all Windows machines, millions of them that the spammers control. One last question. Okay. Um, I, I had two questions. One's real quick. Um, I saw on your wrist, um, what do you have there? Is it a Nixie tube watch? It's a Nixie tube watch that uses 140 volts on the Nixie tubes. <laughs> and when I turn my wrist, it shows hours and minutes at the rate I would speak it. And my head loves to read it that way. <laughs> I actually awesome. love it as a watch. 
Not, <laughs> not because it's a geek watch, but um, that was the, I'll wear a geek watch for one week, and then I'll go back to my pretty hands <laughs> watch. But this one, I actually like the way it tells time. <laughs> And, really and, cool. and, and I saw somebody wearing one. I looked it up on Google, Nixie Tube Watch. I found it. I got serial number 14, handmade in America, I like to tell people. Wow. Um, my other question was, um, I know with the iPod and the iPhone, um, there's been a lot of, like, a sort of battle between people who want to modify the system and Apple, like, trying to prevent that, trying to make it into a paid system. Um, what's your opinion on that? Well, I haven't seen that huge a battle. I'm sorry it exists. I, want, I think it should be open. What made the Apple II so successful in the early days, it was an incredibly open machine. We published every schematic and listing and information on how to make your own cards to plug in, how to write your drivers on them, how to add devices, how to write software in many languages. Um, and all these companies, thousands of companies sprung up from little people that never in their life would have a chance to have their own company. Some of them were in high school. And they started writing programs or designing little pieces of hardware, selling it for the Apple II. And it was such a huge market to see the number of just really young and small people that had a chance now to be something in the world. It was an incredible time. And it gets closed down when a company has a product that's not very open. I hope that Apple's SDK leads to a lot more of these, you know, young startups, you know, finding a way to make some nice piece of software for the iPhone. Um, and we can get away from I hope. I hope that they're adequate enough for the masses, that we don't even need the hacking. Um, and I can understand some reasons why you'd have to close up a new product, but I can't understand why you wouldn't let me put a ringtone into my iPhone. I'm not going to destroy the world, or why I can't have stereo Bluetooth. There's some things that, you know, I just as an engineer, it's just, I'm sorry, it doesn't equate. <laughs> so good luck with, yeah, good luck with all your products. I love mine.